Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to day two of the Smart City World Congress here in Barcelona. My name is Georgie Barrett. I'm a tech journalist and broadcaster in the UK, and it's my great pleasure to be your host for the second day. We've got a brilliant day ahead full of keynotes, inspirational talks, plenary sessions, and then this evening we have our award ceremony followed by our smart party. Just a quick note, we do have translator headsets, um, both in English and in Spanish. So if you would like one, just simply go out the doors at the back and turn right, and there's people handing them out there. Also, I have been noticing we've been trending on Twitter the past couple of days. So if you do want to tweet anything, please do make sure you use the hashtag SC. Uh, SCEWC17. It's a complicated one, but you'll find it. It's all good. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote this morning. Robert Mugger is co founder of the Igarape Institute, a do tank as well as a think tank. His work focuses on emerging data driven security and justice across Latin America and Africa. In this keynote, he's going to show us some stunning data visualizations of the most urgent threats facing cities around the world. Now, we will have five minutes at the end for a Q&A. So if you would like to submit any questions, please do so via the app. It's pretty simple to do. Just click through to the Ask and Vote section. Um, and we also have mics. We can do it the old-fashioned way as well. All right, please put your hands together for Robert Mugger. So I've got a message for you from the future, and it's this. Cities are essential to our survival in the 21st century. If we design our cities right, that is, if we build in resilience, we just might make it through to the 22nd century. If we get them wrong, we don't stand a chance. Now look, all of you know that cities are dual-edged. On the one side, cities are a triumph of political, economic, and social engineering. If you live in a city, and every single one of you does, you're going to live longer, be healthier, be wealthier, be better educated than your rural counterparts. There's a reason why millions of people are moving to cities every single week. But cities have a dark side. Cities consume more than 75% of the world's energy resources, and they generate more than 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Millions of people die violently in our cities every single year from crime, from car accidents, and also from pollution. Air, water, and soil pollutants right now are amongst the primary causes of premature death around the world. But one of our biggest problems might be that apart from a couple of hundred super-connected global cities, we don't know what's happening in the vast majority of the world's cities around the world, especially in the global south, in Africa and Asia, where 90% of future urban population growth is set to take place in the next two to three decades. Why do we have this knowledge gap? Well, one of the problems is we still see the world through the lens of nation states. We're still caught in this 17th century paradigm of national sovereignty. Our global affairs are still mediated by national diplomats operating in the national interest. What makes matters worse is that these nation states are in decline. This 400-year-old experiment is beginning to wind down. Nation states are just not agile enough to deal with the multiple convergent threats that our world faces. Part of the reason for this is hyperglobalization and the fourth industrial revolution which are eviscerating the capabilities of nation states to operate from above. Another factor is turbocharged urbanization, which is literally reconfiguring the map demographically, economically, and politically from below. So the world's changed. When nation states first burst on the scene, right around here in the 1600s, just 1% of the world's population lived in a nation state. Today, all of you know, it's more than 54%. And by 2050, it's going to be 70% of the world living in cities. So yes, we have these 193 nation states. 
but there are also hundreds of cities that are beginning to rival them in power and influence. Just take a look at London or Osaka with GDPs of $650 billion a year. That makes their economies bigger than Argentina, than Sweden or Switzerland. Or look at Barcelona with its not so paltry GDP of $170 billion, which is larger than the Czech Republic's or Hungary. So while London, Osaka, Barcelona, Dubai, Mumbai and Shanghai are punching above their weight economically, they're punching way below their weight politically. And that's going to have to change, or they, you, are not going to be able to deal with some of our greatest challenges. I think it's more appropriate to think about the world through the lens, not of nation states, but of cities. We are, after all, an urban species. Cities are growing in number of size. We have super cities, mega cities, hyper cities, new urban forms that we haven't actually seen ever in the history of our species. And future urban population growth is not going to be restricted to these mega cities of 10 million people or more alone, mesmerizing as they are. No, the vast majority of future population growth is going to be rural folks moving into smaller and medium sized cities that are going to proliferate around the world. It's less spectacular, but no less significant. We're also going to see an incredible amount of growth in the coming decades in informal settlements as a result of the speed of population growth. Right now, more than 1.2 billion people live in a slum. By 2030, it's going to be closer to 2 billion. So while we're here this week to celebrate smart cities and all of the <laughs> extraordinary dividends that they're going to bring, it's important to crawl the dark underbelly of turbo urbanization. Many of the world's fastest growing cities are urbanizing before they industrialize. And this is putting extraordinary stress on the ability of services to be able to deliver the goods and the infrastructure so desperately needed by the citizens. This data visualization I'm going to show you today it was developed by Carnegie Mellon University's Create Labs AI and Robotics Institute, together with my institute and a whole bunch of other folks. And what I want to do is highlight just a few of the mega threats that we're facing, but also, really importantly, some of the solutions that cities have been developing to address them. What you see right here is every single city in the world with a population of 250,000 people or more. There's 2,100 of them, for those of you who are interested. And without going into too much technical detail, the redder and larger the circle, the more fragile that city is. The smaller and the bluer that circle is, the more resilient. And you're seeing a 15-year spread. It's made up of a composite index of 11 different metrics. Now, fragility is what occurs in a city when there is a disequilibrium in the social contract, when there is a rupture between the expectations of the leaders and the residents. And it's a manifestation not of just one single risk, but of a convergence of multiple kinds of risks. Population growth, income inequality, concentrated poverty, reduced access to employment, limited access to services, pollution, homicide, increased exposure to droughts, floods, and cyclones. Now, all cities are fragile to greater or lesser degree. Some cities are just simply more fragile than others. What we see right now is a deepening of fragility, especially in those parts of the world that are least prepared to equip, equipped to deal with it, in sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, into South Asia and South and Southeast Asia. Now, when cities become too fragile, they can collapse, they can tip over and ultimately fail. And what may have begun as a trickle of out-migration can turn into a flood of refugees. Refugees. Today, there are 22 million refugees around the world, more than at any other time since the middle of the 20th century. As you can see, though, there's not one single refugee crisis. There are multiple overlapping and interlocking crises. And I want to raise just two points here about this image. First, in contrast to what often we read in the news, especially here in the West, the vast majority of refugees aren't moving from poor countries to Western countries. No, they're moving from poor cities to even poorer cities. Just 10% of the world's refugees actually make it to the industrialized West. 90% are eking out an existence in neighboring cities. The second point I want to raise here is the relationship between violence and refugees. There is this myth right now that refugees somehow are bringing violence with them, political violence and or terrorism. What you see here is every single reported incident of terrorism going back 15, 20 years, overlaid with refugee flows. 
The idea that refugees bring terrorism with them is often peddled by xenophobic and, let's be honest, populist and nationalist politicians. Their goal often is to shut down borders, to increase homogeneity, to restrict diversity. Yet cities, including this one, have shown extraordinary generosity in welcoming refugees. While the challenges of social integration and social cohesion building when you have new population groups, whether migrants or refugees, is extraordinarily difficult and challenging, and let's be honest about that, open cities in the long term tend to be more diverse, more robust, and often more profitable. Each of these points on the map represents dozens of stories of survival and struggle. But it's also important to reflect what's not on this map, and that's internally displaced people. In addition to the 22 million refugees, there are over 36 million internally displaced people, people who live in refugee-like situations but are not afforded the same protection and care. And the number of refugees and internally displaced is going to grow, especially when we think about climate change. Climate change, and in particular rising sea levels due to temperature change, is the gravest existential threat that our cities face today. That's because two-thirds of our cities, all cities, are coastal. And they're especially vulnerable to storm surges and tidal flows. The latest estimate suggests that as many as one billion people will be forced to relocate as a result of sea level rise and all the attenuated consequences in the next 20 years. It's literally reconfiguring where and how we live, reversing thousands of years of urban planning. What you see here are projected changes of temperature in the bottom left corner, and then changes in sea level rise. Recall that the Paris Climate Agreement set a pretty modest target of two degrees Celsius. Mega cities like Shanghai are gonna be hit especially hard. Commercial districts, industrial areas, and farmland are all on the front line. Other large cities like Dhaka, Shenzhen, Bangkok and Hong Kong are facing similarly real risks. Yet preparations there are still incipient. We haven't gone nearly far enough to prepare ourselves for the literal coming storm. Sea level rises are not just going to affect real estate assets and, and, and properties. We're also going to see salinization of land, destruction of water reserves, and so much more. Of course, this isn't a problem just for Asia or the South Pacific or Africa, and it really is. It's also a problem for the Americas. The US, and especially the East Coast of the US, is going to be particularly badly hit, especially Miami. At two degrees Celsius, Miami is going below sea level. Miami's actually moving now into kind of panic mode. Local authorities there are pleading with residents to set up Miami essentially social bonds, city bonds, to upgrade pumps, to improve drainage systems, to elevate buildings. But this city, like so many others, is in trouble because Miami is built on porous limestone, on a swamp. And no amount of break wall around the outside is going to keep those waters from coming. Now, there is a certain irony here that may not be lost on some of you, which is that uh, the climate denier in chief's uh, residence in the winter White House, Mar a Lago, may be one of the first to go. But for those Europeans in the room who feel somehow that you're safe, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. Uh, commercial and financial hubs like Amsterdam and London are going to be severely affected. Here we are in Barcelona, one of the smartest cities in Europe, if not the world. And we could see entire neighborhoods wiped out. Transport infrastructure and major industries are all near the waterfront, and they're a risk. Cities like Barcelona need to prepare, as I'm sure they are, with adaptation measures as well as mitigation measures. This means building in all of the usual smart paraphernalia, sensors, pumps, new elevated buildings, better materials, but you also got to start investing in that soft stuff. Beach nourishment, wetland restoration, and most importantly, education of your public about what's going to come, an honest conversation. And if you think the storms and the floods that we've been seeing over the last couple of years are bad, I'm, I'm afraid they're just a warm-up for what's about to come. Sea level rise is, of course, strongly correlated with the heating of our planet. We know that the world is getting hotter. The last four years have been the hottest on record. Rising temperatures can have deadly impacts on cities, including water shortages, heat islands, and surging demand for electricity, which, of course, puts more stress on the importance of producing more energy. What is the leading cause of global warming? Well, it's carbon emissions. Carbon emissions can be naturally occurring and human-induced. The burning of fossil fuels and forests are probably amongst the chief culprits. What you see here right now are fires from space 
over a three-year period. It's quite recent, up until, in fact, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this image gives you a sense of the monumental impacts, our impacts, on the world. There's some clear patterns here. Above and below the equator, you'll see these blooms. That's essentially slash and burn agriculture, as pastoralists and others are burning land to allow the green shoots to grow so that their livestock can get access to nourishment. Now, the same pattern is being repeated, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but across South and Southeast Asia. This isn't so much a problem made by cities as a problem for cities. All of you who've been reading the news know that New Delhi, in the last two weeks, uh, has experienced an extraordinary smog being generated by biomass uh, and fires being burnt in the countryside. The city has been literally shut down. Hundreds of schools have been closed. There is road chaos. Uh, one quarter of all Indian children living in Delhi right now have pulmonary infections. And it's not just the fires. You can also see the impacts of steel plants, coal production, gas flares and oil rigs across China through to the Middle East and into the United States. The quantity of carbon being generated every single year is equivalent of hundreds of millions of cars on the road. Now, no city is an island. Every city is connected to its rural hinterland in complex uh, ways. Another risk that we're facing, though, in these rural hinterlands is deforestation, industrial-scale deforestation. And it's affecting our planet, both, through new, both by producing new emissions, but also by reducing the ability of forests to capture carbon. So it's a race to the bottom. I want to take you to the northern Amazon right here in the state of Redonia. This is a few thousand kilometers away from where I live. Uh, this is emitting, this is basically a road cut through the middle of the forest, and on each side you see land being cleared for soy production, for sugar, but most importantly, for meat. Now, any of you who know Brazilians know that Brazilians have an insatiable demand for meat, especially in Sao Paulo and Rio and some of the biggest cities. But that's not what's really driving these trends. This is about emerging markets around the world, especially in China, Asia, but also about Western Europe, Europe and North America demanding more beef. The sheer pace and scale of deforestation uh, beggars the imagination. Ever since the 1990s, what you can see here is the relative decrease uh, in forests marked out in red. If you could see it, there's not very much of it, you'd see little spots of blue, which also suggests there's been a net increase in forest cover in the last 14 years. And if there's purple, there's some combination of the two. But as you scale out, you get a sense of just the sheer magnitude of the impacts on our world. And there's a real risk right now that we're at the point of creating irreversible tipping points from which we may not recover. Already, we're seeing transpiration rates decreasing. We're seeing changes in cloud cover. We're seeing groundwater diminishing. And large cities, including my own in Rio de Janeiro, we're seeing water shortages and we're having to ration our water. In Brazil, we're also seeing incredible impacts in terms of water shortages. 850 Brazilian cities currently suffer from routine chronic water shortages, and this in a country with 20% of the known water supply. But all's not lost. What you see here are national, state parks and protected areas. And while they're not perfect, this particular kind of intervention actually reduces encroachment and limits the rate of deforestation. And it's not just in Brazil. Parks and protected areas are abundant all over the world and are probably one of the most straightforward ways that we can start addressing some of our biggest challenges. So while the future is volatile, uncertain, and turbulent, there are some solutions. And here's my punchline. Cities can and must be part of that solution. The good news is they're already taking action. Take the case of the recent Paris Agreement on climate change. We had 174 nation states that signed up, but the real story were the 7,400 cities that signed a global covenant to reduce emissions and deliver carbon-free transport and housing. Meanwhile, in the United States, when President Trump withdrew the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement, 376 cities across the United States stood up in defiance and demanded not just to implement those commitments, but to go far beyond them. And it's not just climate change. Cities are getting together in coalitions and pooling their resources to deal with everything from migration to climate change to, ref to, to, to urban governance and crime. What we're seeing right now is a new politics 
of empowered cities emerging. Cities are agitating for a kind of urban sovereignty when nation states default on their national sovereignty. And whether it's in the defense of climate or undocumented migrants, they're not asking for permission from their national authorities. So what kind of things are they doing? Well, in talking with hundreds of mayors and urban planners and architects and really smart people like yourselves, a couple of basic principles have come out. First, cities set a plan and they implement it. This is the softest, but perhaps the wisest of solutions. It's straightforward, set a plan. But what's remarkable is just how few cities actually have a plan. They're just too busy running around trying to solve daily problems. Yet a plan, a basic vision, bold targets, a route to achievement is critical. Without it, you're literally flying blind. This isn't the same thing as a master plan, which most cities ought to have. What is needed is a city strategy that's renewed, that's adapted, that's upgraded over time. It should set out both the digital and the physical backbone for the city, but it needs to be negotiated. Singapore offers a really interesting model. It set out a 50-year plan in 1971 and renews it every five years. What Singapore teaches us is the power of continuity. The most successful cities set long-term plans at multiple levels of government. Singapore also reminds us the power of autonomy. Cities need the discretion to be able to tax, to raise debt, to, to zone appropriately, to build affordable housing, even when states get in the way. Cities need the spaces to take those risks, but they also need to get access to financing that is de-risked. This is fundamentally about governance. And it almost certainly will require a renegotiation of the relationship between cities and their nation states. Second, go green. Cities are already leading global decarbonization efforts. We're seeing cities independently introduce congestion scheme pricing, uh, emissions reductions target, uh, introducing more diverse building codes, using smarter construction materials, setting up smart grids, painting rooftops white, and so much more. Cities, counties, and states around the world are investing heavily in multimodal energy solutions as well, including wind and solar. More than 8,000 cities around the world currently have some type of solar energy production uh, capability. More than 1,000 cities have hydroelectric power that, are, that actually powers a local grid. And 300 cities around the world have declared complete energy autonomy. So cities are taking action. The third lesson, build densely, but also sustainably. The death, as all of you know of any city, is the sprawl. By contrast, cities that are zoned right can save energy, reduce emissions, and become more livable. But cities also need to have a balance. They need to know when not to build, so as not to reproduce vertical sprawl or slums of downward mobility. The way not to do this is Las Vegas. Las Vegas' population has grown dramatically over the last 30 years, but it's also sprawled over that same period. Why? Well, less than 5% of the population of Las Vegas gets to work using public transport. The vast majority take the car. It's the only large, one of the only large cities in the United States that doesn't have either heavy or light rail. 42 million people visit Las Vegas a year, which explains why it's one of the most congested cities in North America. Fourth, integrate, invest in integrated and multi-use solutions. The most successful cities are those that are not going to invest in solutions that solve just one problem, but those that solve multiple challenges. Take the case of integrated public transport. Integrated public transport, including uh, rapid bus transit, uh, metro, including walkways, bikeways, and boatways, when they're done well, doesn't just reduce congestion and a city's carbon footprint. It can go much further than that. It can, it can actually lead to improvements in public health because more people are outside and walking. It can reduce levels of crime because more people have access to predictable transport. It can also reduce dispersion in the city because more people are integrated. Take a look at Seoul. Seoul really got it right, because its population doubled in size over the last 30 years, but its footprint has barely moved. And one of the reasons for that is that it has one of the most extraordinary public transport systems in the world, which 75% of Seoul's residents take advantage of. Finally, 
work in global coalitions. There's been a veritable explosion of international inner-city networks linking cities from across different contexts around the planet. This is a wonderful expression of that. There are currently more than 200 inner-city networks that deal with issues as wide-ranging as climate to migration to safety. Inspiring examples are the C40, the UCLG, ICLEI, uh, EuroCities, uh, the US, Covenant, uh, US uh, Conference of Mayors, and so many more. And I believe many of you are in this room today. There's also a new global parliament of mayors established in 2016, which is seeking to empower cities to assume a greater leadership role and speak with a common voice. What all of these city coalitions have in common is that they're seeking to amplify the voice of cities on the global stage. These inner city networks, they share experiences. They allow different cities to leapfrog by identifying new kinds of technologies. They spread insights about what works, but most importantly, what doesn't work. Cities have that necessary upward and downward accountability to lead nothing less than a devolution revolution. At best, cities can trigger a renewal of democratic action from below, which is so desperately needed today. At the very least, cities are the perfect antidote to reactionary nationalism and populism that's sweeping the world. And city leaders are really used to leading this kind of fight. Mayors recognize that the global challenges of today are intimately linked with the local challenges of today. They think locally. And because mayors take citywide views, they're, by definition, systems thinkers. They're pulling themselves out of those silos to think across the wide range of challenges they face. They're not just interested in smart solutions, they're interested in wise solutions. So at this moment, precisely when our nation states are frozen and our international institutions are paralyzed to act, it's cities and city planners and the private sector that are getting busy solving some of the world's most intractable challenges. And it's up to us to give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. It's amazing when you watch it, just all in one go. It's a really powerful effect. Right, we're going to have some audience q and I'm going to start with the app, and then um, if, has anyone got a question that they'd like to ask at the mic? Got anyone? OK, well, let, let me start with the app, and then if you'd like to ask a question, we'll get you sorted with the mic. OK, um, so how do you involve citizens into smart city actions, especially in countries such as Brazil, where the gap between social classes is so big? Well, I mean, I think there's been a revolution in technology. I mean, the vast majority of, of the world's youth right now have access to a telephone, to connectivity. It's one of the first things they acquire. Uh, and, you know, that other billion that don't have access right now are about to get access in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, so I think it's, there's a real opportunity there to start harnessing that, cap you know, that power of the Internet, the power of mobility. Um, and the power of these kinds of visual tools to try to engage young people in a conversation. Um, I think they're, they urgently want to be part of that discussion. I think young people today often feel they're being talked at, not talked to, uh, and they want to co-create and co-produce different kinds of solutions. So harnessing that collective wisdom of all of these young people online, I think, is one way to engage. And, and, and do you think you know, your socioeconomic class has a part to play in that and how much you are engaged in these issues? No, absolutely. I mean, look, I live in Brazil, um, you know, where <laughs> more than half the population is in well below the middle class. Um, and so they're fundamental to having, being part of that conversation. So um, I think some of the most active and exciting, you know, uh, you know engagement happening online is happening in, in those lower sectors of the economy. Um, because for a lot of people in the developing world, the internet and mobility, mobile phones, are not just a, a plaything. They're not something to, to, to chat on social media about. This is about economic, political, and social empowerment. This is a tool that actually allows them to engage in a global marketplace or a national marketplace in new and fundamental ideas, in, in new and fundamental ways. I, a great example of this is in Kenya with M-Pesa uh, and the rise of electronic uh, you know, currencies. Um, so I think you're going to see more, if you think the internet today is complicated with all of that uh, you know, rabble and discussions ongoing, it's going to become a hell of a lot more complicated as, as the rest of the developing world gets online. Great. Any questions from the floor? Yes, that gentleman. Would you mind just standing up, just literally the mic, oh, behind, oh, turn around. Yeah, there it is. 
Good morning. Thank you very much for a uh, really well said uh, presentation. My name is Santor from Tel Aviv based Humo Urban Mobility. And my question is there's some dissonance uh, in my perception between we always say that 54% of the world population live in, in cities and then they, they contribute 80% of, uh, of the footprint, carbon footprint. On the other hand, we say that per person, the urban footprint per capita is lower than the countryside. Somewhere, somehow the numbers don't match, and I'd, I'd like your reply on that. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, and I was thinking about that on the way over, actually, about that disparity. I think part of it is that um, a lot of our cities are sprawling. A lot of our cities are spread out. They weren't designed. They're designed according to a model, an outdated model based on maximum amount of land um, and minimum consideration of the externalities that were generated by, say, our, our energy use. Um, and I think these kinds of cities that are sprawl, the Las Vegases, the Fort Worth Texases, the Houstons, not to pick only on Texas, uh, but these kinds of cities, but we're seeing the same thing being reproduced in some ways in parts of Africa and, and parts of Asia, uh, are highly inefficient in terms of their, uh, their contribution. So while some cities, like the dense cities of New York, for example, or, or London, or Paris, or um, Singapore, or even, frankly, some cities in, in uh, highly concentrated cities in, in South Asia and, and Africa can actually reduce the amount of the footprint. It's those spread out, sprawled out cities that I think are actually you know, disproportionately allocating that, that excess uh, carbon emission that you're referring to. Thank you. Yes, that gentleman there. Hello, thank you very much for that. My name is Paul DeConcoli-Tega. I'm manager of operations at Numina. And my specific question is, uh, a lot of the speakers yesterday referred to this as a technology conference, and um, understandably there's a lot of policy considerations that need to be understood when decarbonizing and planning for smart cities. So I suppose I'm interested in your perspective on reconciling policy and procurement models for these more integrative solutions that solve multiple problems at once, um, when, as I understand it, cities currently have quite a lot of difficulty doing that. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, I had two thoughts on, on, on that. One is I think we still are stuck, you know, in, whether it's the national level, whether it's the state or the municipal level, in our siloed ways of thinking. Um, and so we still, including when it comes to procurement, so we're still dealing with a highly heterogeneous, highly diversified, highly segmented uh, way of planning. Um, and I think some of the more exciting models that are emerging amongst smarter cities or wiser cities are those where the mayor and or the local centralized authority bring together multiple players in regular routine discussions to reflect on you know, what are the latest innovations, what are the, what are the possibilities that are out there, what are the priorities, what are the needs, and then they integrate that with a kind of dialogue with the citizens. I was recently in Dubai, um, and there's a number of colleagues here from Smart City Dubai and elsewhere, uh, and they were reflecting on uh, how there are, uh, there's a strategy that the local, local authorities use to um, have every single department come up with a series of ideas uh, to take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, of these various, in, in the case of carbon uh, emissions reductions, strategies, uh, technologies that are associated with that. Uh, but they come together and they every year come up with a minimum of five, I think three to five strategies uh, across every single department that then becomes part of that renewed city plan. So, you know, I think it's, it is a great challenge, um, but it requires leadership. It requires a rethinking of the mental model of how you administer. It requires the courage to bring together your departments. It requires the wisdom of having people in your department who understand the long-term historical trends, but also some of the future trends. Another great example is Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne has an individual inside the, 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 um, the city council who I happened to just spend a couple of days with in Dubai last week. Uh, named Rob Adams, who spent over 36 years working inside the city uh, as a hired employee to help them think about the overall strategy, thinking historically, but also forward. Um, you know, not every city can have a Rob Adams, although I think they ought to, uh, but it's an example of, of valuing the integrity of your civil servants, not privatizing and outsourcing everything, and ensuring there's some continuity in the long term to allow for that kind of reflection to take place. The final example is a 100 Resilient Cities initiative. Um, I'm sure there's somebody here from 100 Resilient Cities as well. Uh, what they've done is their model is they've, hired, they've, they've developed resiliency officers uh, for the 100 participating cities, whose job it is, is to help provide that kind of integrated, holistic view to bring together the different players uh, to think about you know, innovative solutions. Uh, I think the problem is, just I mean, maybe the, the nutshell, is that, you know, and I, I don't want to 
I don't want to diminish for a second the extraordinary potential uh, of a lot of these new emerging technologies, but we tend to get uh, drawn to the big shiny things before dealing with some of the soft requirements of governance, management, rethinking targets, setting metrics of success, uh, and, and monitoring those over time. And what happens is cities often lurch from technology to technology, spending money they may not have without having that kind of integrated view. And I know that's a bit cliche, I know everyone says it, but it's so true. Yeah. Robert, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank ah. you very much. Thank Round you. of applause for thank Robert Mugger. Thank you.